we, we have this crazy tradition uh, here, which is that if you're the minister here, you write a communion letter every time there's a communion service coming up. <laughs> so I don't know why that is or where that started. I fell into it when I, when I came here some years ago, so I've been doing it for a while. And, uh, you know, it, it's like two weeks or so before it's communion time. Lynn, our administrator here, tells me that, well, Harry, you know, you've got to get a, a letter out, eh? <laughs> oh. <laughs> So, that, but then I, you dig in, and it's a great, it's a great uh, kind of discipline for me because it causes me to think about things kind of afresh, and and to write because I, I do like to write, and I hardly ever do it. You know, uh, I don't know sermons. I don't really write them. I just kind of you know. So uh, writing is fun, <laughs> and uh, so, so it, it gets my mind stirred up. So I wrote one this week, this for this communion today, which was a little bit different, I thought, and I thought I'd expound, uh, expand, that's right, expand on it just a bit more uh, today. Um, so it's based on this kind of rhythm that's in the Gospels of when Jesus and his disciples would get together to eat. <laughs> uh, and it, it says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, uh, gave thanks, broke it, and then, and then gave it to the people, distributed it to the people. So that, that happens on the, at the Lord's Supper, for instance. That's in Mark 14 is, is what I used as the, the, the opener for the letter. But if you go back, I think it's several other times through the Gospels. For instance, it is at the time of Jesus feeding the 5,000. They brought him, like, they had, what, five loaves and two fish or something like this? And thousands of people to feed. And they said, how can we feed all? So it says he, he, took, the, he took it, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them. So there's, there's something going on here. There's a rhythm that's going on here. And I thought we'd think about what the meaning of that is. Well, in the first instance, of course, it, it's, it was a Jewish tradition. That was the way that uh, you, would, you would kind of celebrate the, the, uh, the fact that you have food and, and you would break the bread and then people, so it wasn't just, it was enough for many and you'd break it up and, and pass it around. And our, our traditions of Thanksgiving really go back to the, our Jewish roots, our, Israeli, our Israelite roots, if you will. Back in the Old Testament, there was a huge thing about uh, you know, all these laws of Moses and all these uh, kinds of offerings and sacrifices you were to bring to the temple. Well, one of them was the thank offering. And the thank offering was just something that would come from your heart that you would bring to God and, and offer just, you know, you didn't have to. You just, because you were thankful, thankful, you would bring a thank offering, usually at the time of the harvest. It would be something that came up from the harvest. And so that's kind of how we've come to that tradition today. And, you know, the Jewish people in Jesus' day and still to this day would, would, would do kind of a grace or a thanksgiving before, before meals and, and break the bread and so on. I was, I was kind of privileged back when I was, I'm going to say, 18-ish, 17, 18, to, uh, to work at Camp Northland, which is a Jewish camp here in Halliburton County, um, kind of up um, almost to Halliburton Lake. And... Um, so every time there was a meal, all the kids would come into the, the, uh, you know, the main dining area and they would say the grace really fast. So it's the only Hebrew I know because <laughs> I was there all summer. And he goes, Baruch atah Adonai, Elchino, Melech, Elohim, Musi, Lachim, Elohim, Blessed are thou, Lord of God, who brings forth bread from the earth. I meant, dig in. <laughs> so it was, it was in Hebrew, Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, who bringeth forth bread from the earth. Amen. That was the Jewish, uh, the, the standard prayer that they would pray every time. So, so in the first instance, this whole kind of breaking and distributing the bread of life, the life for our bodies, is, is kind of obvious. In the second instance, Jesus applies that to himself. And that's where it gets interesting and intriguing and, and deeper. So he, he, sa- he does this whole thing and then he says, this is my body broken for you. So it's not just bread now. He says, this represents some, in some way, mysterious or otherwise, me- metaphorical, allegorical. This is my body, my life, which is broken for you. And then he, he hands it out. And that's, that's the core of the good news of Christ, the good news of the gospel, um, that, that God in, in this man, Jesus, came among us and was broken for us. I mean, he was wounded for us. He, 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 he was humiliated, he suffered, and he died for us. So the cross is about this, the brokenness of our God in, in, in public, you know, in, a, in, in our place and for our sins. Uh, and so this is not a God who lords it over us, who, you know, who, is, who is powerful and mighty and shall smite us. This is a God who, who walks with us and who suffers with us and who is even broken and, and dies 
for us. So Jesus, Jesus says, this is, this is my body, broken, for you. And then he hands it out to them. So, so, so part of this is that, that Jesus has been broken at the cross, and now the word of that, the word of life, uh, goes out to, uh, to the whole world. It starts it's by the simple proclamation or te- testimony of those who have, who have come to know him, who have, who have encountered Christ, who have encountered his grace, who have, who have eaten of what the Jesus calls the bread of life. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. So this is this bread which mysteriously, when we proclaim the, per- the, the, the message of Jesus and what he has done and who he is, he is the Lord, uh, God, God uses that in people's lives. And it, he's used it in our, our lives. It's a mystery, really. I mean, it's, it, the Holy Spirit takes the proclamation of Jesus Christ and changes people <laughs> and, 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 and brings the life of Christ to us, the bread of life. So when we celebrate communion in a few minutes, that's what we're remembering. We're remembering this, this act of brokenness, this uh, sacrificial deed that, that Christ made. And he is God the Son on our behalf. So uh, the, the, there are other instances. I, I kind of, I, I, I've talked a bit about this guy Henry Nouwen, who's a, a, a Dutch priest who died actually 20 years ago. And he's kind of my newest spiritual mentor dude. <laughs> so I've been reading his books. I took a course on him in the summer while I was on sabbatical. And he does a lot of thinking about this kind of stuff. So he's a priest. So priests, characteristically, um, uh, what's the word? They, they celebrate the Mass every single day. Right? Every day they have, they, they have communion. And so every week, of course, when, when the church gathers together, and sometimes several times a week, other people will join in with them. But priests, priests will celebrate it every single day. And so that caused him to do a lot of thinking about it. So, and then he, so he writes about it a lot, and he talks about it a lot. And so this isn't, I don't think, exactly what he thought, but it, it, this got me to thinking a little bit about that sort of thing and how, what other meanings are in this. And I think this applies to us as, as uh, the disciples of Christ or the followers of Jesus, that the, the cycle of taken, he gives thanks, he breaks, and then he distributes it, he, he gives it out. So first of all, we're taken. We're taken, we're kind of captured by Christ. I mean, he, he, he gets hold of our lives. I don't know if you realize that, but you probably do. <laughs> like, how does this happen? C.S. Lewis, who wrote the, the Chronicles of Narnia and other things, I'm a lover of, of C.S. Lewis, he, he thought he was an atheist, or he said he was an atheist, but he was so honest. He kept studying and thinking it through and using logic for you know, the world he saw around him and and, and finally, he says, I, I was dragged kicking and screaming into the kingdom of God. <laughs> he, just, he just was kind of overcome by the, it, it had to be so. You can read about this in the Mere Christianity, which is kind of, it, it shows something of his thinking and of his journey. Um, so he dragged kicking and screaming. Last week, we had, to, we had a, uh, the burger, beer, and Bible thing at, the, at McKex again on Tuesday night. And the question of the day was, should everybody be a Christian? And I threw it out there because I just wanted to get some inflammatory topic to get people mad so that they'd come and, of course not, what's the matter with you? It didn't quite work that way. But we, had, we had eight people, and I would say maybe four would have disagreed and four would have agreed, roughly. Uh, so, so that's my thinking. I think everybody should be a Christian. In other words, I mean, if, if, this is, if the, the gospel is true and this is God's way to reconcile us to himself, it's his grace offered to humankind, then yeah, of course. Why doesn't, God wants us all to partake of that. He wants us all to be his children and to be, you know, to be, to be rejoined to him and healed and, and forgiven. So that's, that's my argument. And uh, so, th- so I had my piece and then we kind of went around and everybody had a turn. And one of the guys, I won't mention his name, Wayne, although it was you. <laughs> I lied, I will mention your name. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's my middle name, discreet. <laughs> so, so Wayne, Wayne says, well, yeah, well, but how can everybody be a Christian? Because, you know, basically it's who God chooses to be a Christian, right? Um, he, he, like, see, he seems to choose some and not others. Like, what's happening there? And it, the, here's a big theological. So, so we started to scratch our heads a little bit on that. We decided that was too big a question for Tuesday night. <laughs> That's a whole other debate. But it's something to think about. And 
you know, those that have, have studied the Gospels and are theologians and stuff have argued about this endlessly. So, so for instance, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. It's a promise of Christ. But it tells us, so you, you can choose to come to him. You can choose to believe in him. You can use your volition to do those things. <clears throat> you can use your will to, to do those things, to come to Christ or to, to believe in Christ. So it must be our choice then. Leaf through this same book, John, to chapter 15. Jesus says in quite clear language, he says, he says you have not chosen me, I have chosen you. <laughs> what is it? And, you know, a careful reading of Scripture has both all the way through. All the way through. The, 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 I mean, the word, the elect of God is, is used. The, the chosen of God is used. And yet, over and over again, it's God calls us to choose. He said, you know, choose you this day whom you shall serve. So, you know, you can't squeeze, we can't squeak out of it by saying, oh, well, God didn't choose me, so <laughs> it's our choice. But it's God's choice, too, in, in a bigger sense. Because God's will is, more, is, is greater than our will. So anyway, we won't, won't go any further than that. But, but we are taken. We are captured. We are, we are brought to the table. We are brought to, into God's family by his sovereign power and will. And, and then I think... That in the mystery of the Trinity, if you will, <laughs> again, we're getting real mysterious here, Jesus gives thanks to the Father for us. So that's part of what's going on in, in the mystery of, of, of who God is. He, he, he rejoices in us. And I, I don't think we say that enough or consider that enough. We sort of think, oh, we're supposed to give thanks to God all the time, which we are. <laughs> but we know that God is giving thanks for us. Like he, is, he is delighted in us. That's what we're saying. Father of lights, you delight in your children. And the other, the other churches, our second scripture reading was from Philippians 4, where it's kind of a description of how we, uh, about kind of how you pray. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, whatever you come up, come up against, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Now, I think that's pretty, pretty key. Um, it, because all of us have a lot of anxieties all the time. <laughs> You're just, we'd just be kidding ourselves if we would say, we don't get worried, we don't get stressed, that doesn't start to creep up in us and something's starting to get to us. I mean, it's happening probably every day, maybe multiple times a day for all of us. So, so what, what Paul is teaching in the Spirit of God through Paul is saying, here's how to deal with that as a follower of Christ. When anxieties begin to come up, you know, let your requests, let your prayers and petitions be made known to God. Like, take that to the Lord. That's how you practice your faith. This is spiritual discipline, my friends. And it's only by God's grace that we can learn to you know, put this in play in our lives. And as we do that, we find that, you know, oh, this is starting to get to me. We start to catch that. And we, and we, we present it to the Lord in our petitions and our requests. And he throws this little writer in there. He says, with thanksgiving. What? <laughs> I'm overwhelmed and this, my, the world is crushing in on me and you want me to be giving thanks? That's ridiculous. But that's another, that's another depth of spiritual discipline. And it's, it, it's a good one. So basically, even though things are seemingly the worst they can get and we don't know how we're going to get out of this or how we're going to get through this, he says, you can be thankful. Even if you don't feel like being thankful, you can be thankful. Because no matter what, it, there's lots to be thankful for. Uh, I mean, just that we have been created in the image of God. You know, that we are wonderful. We in ourselves are, are wonderful creatures. We're, we're, we're deep. We're, you know, we, we have intricate bodies that are super complex and wonderful in the way they, they operate. But also we have these souls with feelings and, you know, uh, and, and mental capacities that are amazing. <laughs> we're the children of God made in his image and likeness. You know, that's, that's something to be thankful about. And in addition, everything that we have and are is his gift to us. Wow. And this is an amazing God. And he's, he's doing something in our lives. And it may not be comfortable, and we're going to get to that. <laughs> but, but, you know, there's lots of room for thanksgiving. Now, I say that because if that's the pattern for, for prayer and for petition, and Jesus, Scripture says that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, continually interceding for us according to his will. 
So if he's interceding for us, he's petitioning for us, he must also be given thanks for us. Because <laughs> this is how he instructs us to pray. That's just, part of, that's just the way God's nature is. Do you think, you think Jesus is thinking, well, Father, I don't know why you saddled me with this bunch. <laughs> but they need more help. Yeah. It, no. <laughs> that would never be his perspective. It would always be, thank you, Father, for these disciples, these children, the, the, you know, these, these wonderful creations that, that I delight in. They need some help. <laughs> That's how I see it. So he gives thanks. We are his delight, his beloved children. We are the sheep of his pasture. And then he breaks us. And then he breaks us. So here's, here's a pill that it may take us a while to swallow. It may take us years to swallow. And so when I say he breaks us, I mostly mean that he allows us, allows our lives to be broken in some way. Maybe slowly, sometimes quickly. Our own sin may well be the cause of our brokenness. Um, so... Uh, Chuck Colson, some of you can remember back to the days of Watergate. <laughs> and uh, Chuck Colson was one of the, you know, one of the guys, power guys that uh, was with uh, Tricky Nicky, Tricky Dick Nixon. <laughs> okay. And anyway, in the, in the midst of Watergate, he got, he got sent to prison. And uh, it was actually, so, so it was a, a breaking experience for him. Here was a guy with, you know, had kind of walked the corridors of power in, in Washington. Now he's in prison. And that was, it broke him. And actually, he became a Christian. He became a follower, of, a, a very devout follower of Christ in the midst of that. And God used him to start up a prison ministry in the States, which is still the biggest of the prison ministries in the States. Uh, ministries and missions uh, to, to convicts, people that are in prison. But, you know, he was broken because of sin in his own life. So it could be other things. It could be our circumstances. Usually it's, oh, it's, it's a mix of these things. It's, it's, it can be sickness. It can be the loss of someone we love. It can be disability. It can be loss of job. It can be broken relationships. Those are huge. Failures and frustrations of life. So all through those kinds of circumstances which God allows into our lives, Christ allows into our lives, we're broken. Now, he guards us in the midst of that. He's walking with us. He's feeling the pain as, you know, with us as we go through those things. He, uh, um, he, he guards us very carefully through this. He's comforting us. He's encouraging us. And he's often providing us with companions to, to, to help lift or share our load. There's a, there's a great, I love the old hymns. One of the lines of one of the old hymns is, In his arms he gently bears us, rescues us from all our foes. Remember that? So why, why does he allow this, and why does this need to happen? Well, in my letter I had this, this line, and I'm going to just repeat it. We all come to Christ with a certain amount of ingrained callousness, arrogance, self-centeredness, intolerance, and the like. Now, I, I didn't say that to accuse anybody. I say this upon personal reflection of my own experience and what I've found out about myself. <laughs> So I know all that's there, callousness, arrogance, self-centeredness, intolerance, and the like. Christ calls it hardness of heart. And he allows and directs life to happen with its losses and disappointments and failures and sorrows so that this hard shell cracks. This shell needs to be broken in order that the sweet nature of Jesus may pour through us. Yes, we do need breaking. So that's the broken part. And lastly, he gives, us, he gives us out to the world. He gives us out to the world. It's not just his life. The way his life is disseminated or distributed to the world is through us, by him sending us out. The, the New Testament uses a lot of uh, metaphors to, to describe this. So, for instance, the body of Christ. I'll just do the one today. But uh, the body of Christ. In, in uh, his letter to the Corinthians, Paul says, you, you Christians, you the church, if you will, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So in other words, Jesus' physical body is not with us anymore, except in so much as it's, he, he, he is represented through his people. So the way, he doesn't walk among us physically, but we walk on this earth physically, and we are, we are his legs. You know, we are his eyes to see, and we are his ears to hear, and his heart to love. I love John Miller's song, you know, in our, in our famous CD. <laughs> 
Uh, he's walking in my shoes. You know? I think it's, it's actually my favorite song on the CD. You know? He's walking in my shoes. He's speaking with my voice. You know? He's loving with my heart. That's the way it's, it happens. This is the way we are, you know, we have been broken and now we are being distributed into the world. And we are Christ's body, Christ's representation, strange as that may seem in this world. So God's sovereign hand is upon our lives, my friends. You know, he has taken us. He is, he is thankful for us. He does break us gently and carefully. And then he releases his life through us to this needy world. Really amazing. Now, this is a very good thing. And it's actually another reason for us to give him thanks. Thanks.